Welcome back, everybody. I'm Sean LaFlock. I'm here with Scotty Hagness. This is Conversation Fitness, Wellness, and Longevity. Scott, how goes it, man? Hey, it goes pretty good. Post-Christmas, ready for the new year? Heck yeah, definitely. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I just got, like, I was traveling all morning, just got off the plane, uh, did a class, uh, coming back from Cleveland, where it was about, I don't know, 14 degrees, and uh, now I'm back into the 70-degree weather, and uh, all my body wants to do is just shut down right now. It's like home, Charlie, warm, yeah. want to sit in the sun and just chill. But uh, you know, chillax. I took today off. I, 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 you know, over the last few days, I really didn't do too much training. I think I uh, did like a thirty-minute circuit in a living room once, and then I did a workout at the gym with like three sets of five, three sets of five, three sets of five at like sixty percent on like a uh, front squat, a deadlift, and then just did like a some functioning bodybuilding type stuff, and then a 15-minute circuit of, like, running, burpees, running, and box jumps, just to kind of keep myself not completely out of shape mm-hmm. uh, because I'm going to be getting into kind of a, a mini peaking here going into Wadapalooza for the next, like, 10 days or so. Nice. Yeah. Last we talked, you were just kind of going through uh, Hell Week, if I remember correctly. Yep, 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 yep. Everything finished up. Uh, actually, I finished off the week with a 10-minute max calorie assault bike. Ah, I lost you for just a second there, but I got you now. Yep, I, I, I finished it up the week with a max calorie, 10-minute max calorie assault bike. Ouch. <laughs> yep. Uh, it was uh, pretty good. I, I think the biggest nice. thing is that I just lack that uh, high heart rate sustainability. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Uh, or or whatever it might be, like uh, the power outputs that I have to be able to to put out are not done at that 160 heart rate. Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of got to got to push it higher, 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 and um, it's just not quite as sustainable as as it needs to be. Um, which I guess in itself is you know another layer to the puzzle of like, all right, where do we go from here? Because I'm not going to uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think all the foundational work that I've been doing is very, very important. But now it's kind of understanding where do I go from here to be able to sustain those top end heart rates. And maybe now it's the case where, uh, you know, more MAP two and three ish type stuff, you know, one to two minute goes, or maybe even some, uh, some aerobic power work or something like that. But What are your thoughts on that, Scott? Like when you're kind of like, all right, you've pretty much pushed everything you can out with that. Uh, Maybe it's even like lactate repeatability or um, something like that. Uh, What do you feel the limiter is? Is it like your heart rate goes up and then you just physically are unable to keep a pace to keep it there? And does it does it feel like it's like cardiac or respiratory fatigue or? You know, what? Um, I feel it's, it's definitely it's definitely not nearly as bad of a, a burn in the legs as it was prior. Like, you know, during uh, initial testing where it's just like, oh, my legs are locked up and I can't really push anymore. Whereas it's more of a systemic burn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would suggest kind of more respiratory or, or cardiac. I, this probably would be where you could employ some sort of true aerobic power work, you know, where it's shorter, but you're trying to hold maximum heart rate. And you've got um, whatever things you've chosen to do. You know, you can uh, you you can keep moving at a high rate of speed with a high output without mm-hmm. muscular fatigue becoming a shutdown issue. Yep, um, that's actually what I was thinking as well. Just because I, anecdotally looking at my programming and kind of seeing like, uh, what haven't I put in? And it's like those really really high hard intervals. Haven't really seen those yet, just yet. So I'm thinking that might be something to kind of integrate into this last little blip into the training, just get some touches on it. It's not going to be mm-hmm. super, super important. No, and you don't need a lot of it. It's really just a few exposures, you know, dosed with a bit of recovery is enough to kind of touch on it and, yep. and uh, kind of peak it, basically. Take all that work you put in to this point and then, uh, you yeah, know, kind of a, a finishing or a transformation. Yeah. What kind of a, a work to rest ratio would you recommend with that? I, I think three minute ish work is what I've typically seen the best results from, especially if you're trying to extend it out a little bit. Yep. Uh, and uh, depending on I've done a series, so it would be maybe three repeats of that. So nine minutes of work 
Mm -hmm. uh, the rest, I believe, was roughly the same duration, so three, three on, three off kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. And then a longer 10, I don't recall, I'd probably use a variety of things, but 10 to 15 minutes between series. Um, uh, and then a second exposure, probably of a lower overall volume. So, mm -hmm. so like one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, that kind of thing. Oh, I, I would probably still keep it at the three, oh, but, but, uh, but it would less sets. Yeah. Got it. Yes. So maybe four, four repeats, uh, in, but only one series. So you're sustaining a little bit more. Yep. Yep. And just it pretty much holding as, as high of a heart rate during those intervals as you can. Yeah. I mean, like if it's uh, three different three minute blocks, I usually have something different in each of the three minute blocks just so uh, we don't accumulate, have muscular fatigue and we touch on the most movement patterns possible. But the thing you want to avoid doing is getting to a place where your muscles are failing to produce a high output. Um, mm. And, and if, if it, those intervals are done correctly, and you pay attention to what you're feeling internally, like you should really feel like literally your breathing muscles and, and even a kind of inner thing, which I, is, I assume you're feeling your heart. It's like a very internal yeah. burning and fatigue. And that's kind of what you're looking for in this case. Mm. Yep. So I'll probably integrate those over the next 10 days and uh, set my butt off to, to war. Yeah. So to speak. Um, but uh, last podcast, we actually talked a little bit about uh, some of the dysbiosis in the mouth, and I had shot you over a podcast. Um, I don't want to forget her name. Her name is uh, Kara Fitzgerald. Uh, she's a functional medicine practitioner, and she interviewed Dr. Mark Burheen, and I'll put the, uh, the link to the podcast uh, uh, that we're referencing in the comments. Uh, she's out of uh, uh, Connecticut, actually. Uh, so basically the podcast kind of ran through a little bit about how, one, uh, dysbiosis of the mouth uh, leads to all sorts of um, uh, dental issues, whether it be cavities or tooth decay, uh, et cetera. But also, surprisingly enough, uh, kind of dovetailing nicely with what we talk about is uh, the breathing practices of people lead to grinding of the teeth, uh, lead to, uh, you know, this mouth breathing uh, that leads to all sorts of like uh, TMJ type stuff and that kind of thing. But um, I know you kind of got a little bit of a uh, look through on this transcript here, Scott. What are your thoughts on things like that? Have you seen things like this before? Is this something inherently you kind of figured was possible? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, this is the first time I've really uh, read a, you know, where uh, functional dentistry, I guess, has, has uh, kind of gotten involved. Makes perfect sense, and um, you know, knowing how the mouth biome is, you know, in, internal factors going on feed into it, but it can cause internal factors. I mean, I know it's probably 17, 18 years ago. I think I heard of the first connection between potentially uh, dental issues and heart disease, and now we kind of see through chronic infl inflammatory pathways how that might be. Uh, I thought it was interesting how they uh, use C-reactive C protein test as kind of a mm. marker for systemic in inflammation, that, and then you want to rule out if it's coming from uh, any dental issues. So it isn't always what you might think it would be, but I like how they use that as kind of a, a screen. But yeah, and then it makes perfect sense the the downstream and upstream effects of poor breathing patterns. So if we have some of these postural changes in a hyperinflated extended posture, now we're, you know, we're going to have issues with mouth breathing and then that's going to change the oral biome, which is going to yeah. then influence uh, inflammation in the body, uh, bad bacteria, all, all sorts of things. It's just crazy how interconnected uh, everything is that makes perfect sense yep absolutely and it also references the fact that um, why uh, breathing through the nose is actually hugely important uh, not mm -hmm. only for getting proper amounts of oxygen exchange and and, and uh, co2 um, you know getting it out but also how breathing through the nose actually increases nitric, nitric oxide uh, content within the 
uh, air, which then would be a vasodilator to the blood. Uh, so mm-hmm. obviously being, uh, you know, more vas- you're obviously getting more exchange of oxygen as well. So people who uh, want to apply this to exercise, if you're only breathing through your mouth on exercise, you're actually not maximizing the ability for you to exchange uh, gases by breathing only solely through your mouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of uh, a performance aid now in the endurance community in particular is, you know, uh, beet beet root juice and things of this nature and other Uh supplements to increase nitric oxide. But, you know, we can't, we could potentially be missing out on, you know, what I'm sure is a far more potent nitric oxygen. I believe it was uh, 25% of the body's nitric oxide comes Mm -hmm. from uh, bacteria, if I'm correct, right in the nose. Uh, And you're missing out on that if you are not breathing nasally. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So then obviously you can just throw off the pH of the mouth and, and uh, subsequently uh, cause bacterial overgrowth um, in that sense as well. And anecdotally, mm-hmm. you just have uh, people who are mouth breathers tend to have just halitosis. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, they have mm-hmm. sticky breath just because they're constantly exchanging only through the mouth. And that kind of causes some of that bacterial overgrowth. But it, it, it's surprising just because or it's it's, uh, it's it's interesting because we know these bacteria not only feed off of um, you know the the food in our mouth, but actually the gases that are exchanged as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. if anything, it, it runs uh, yeah, like a you know a vicious cycle, like so many processes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it's uh it's it's pretty cool seeing that this is not isolated just to things that we've talked about before in terms of the the gut or even the blood, but now we're looking at the mouth, and now we're starting to see a much big, uh, you know, we're, we're it's kind of like we're, we're in a room, and we can shine a light on one spot, and we get some information there, and then we move into the room, we see another spot over there, and now we're getting so many pieces to this puzzle, we can get a, a, a more clear picture of what this room really looks like, and that room being the complete, um, you know, I guess, uh, puzzle to what complete health is what really all about. Um, mm-hmm. And it, I don't necessarily think it's our job to try and put all of these pieces together, but to have a basic concept of the things that are in the room and what our role might be in those is awesome. Um, especially if you are a person who knows the signs and symptoms of those things and then can actually refer that person to someone who can really uh, get under the hood and start making some significant changes because again, well, our you know this is kind of what I was writing down earlier today in terms of what my role is as a a coach and I think the biggest thing is is bringing people awareness and if I have the knowledge of X Y and Z I may not be able to execute A B and C but I have the knowledge of X Y and Z and I can say listen this is what's going on with you you might want to go see this person so you can get those things taken care of then you're, you're, you're doing what you're really there to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, uh, a lot of things go outside of our scope, but that doesn't mean we can't at least identify the possibility and then us, uh, refer someone out to, or, you know, someone that's appropriate. Um, exactly. For sure. And that, that, um, you know, having a network of individuals to potentially refer out to, um, I think, uh, you know, it, it is a a good, well-experienced, and uh, you know, a good coach is going to have those. And so I'm always trying to facilitate those, but it, it is difficult, but uh, that they're out there if you look. Yeah. And it also, uh, it's awesome with technology nowadays. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be you going to an office. It could be a Skype or a FaceTime conversation. There's all, all these kits that, that people can get now and be sent and they just, to literally prick mm-hmm. their finger, do some simple blood work or some salivary tests, uh, breathing tests, and you send that blood work in, and then bang, you have a FaceTime conversation three or four days later, and you're starting to get yourself in the right direction. So for those of us who are saying, you know, technology is the bane of our existence, I think in a lot of ways when we use technology properly, it could be hugely beneficial because you can be in the middle of Wyoming, be able to be talking to somebody in you know, Connecticut about your, your blood work and all of a sudden you're getting on the right track. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You don't require, you know, hands-on visit in a lot of cases for many of these things. Yep. 
yeah, you know, Skype consult, um, labs that we can do anywhere, go over the results. Boom. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, uh, you know, kind of changing, switching gears here a little bit. There's a book that I recently started reading. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but, uh, the book is called tribe. Uh, it came out fairly recently about in the last year. Uh, it's by a author named, uh, Sebastian Junger. Uh, he wrote the perfect storm as well. Um, if you remember that kind of story mm-hmm. about the uh, the fisherman. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, oh wait, yeah, I believe that's the one. I think that was. I think so. Yeah. Um, anyway, so this one called Tribe. Um, he, you know, it, it's the uh, the concept of the book is that um, through his experiences, uh, he was a, a war journalist. Um, he, I believe he spent time in Kosovo and then also time in Afghanistan. Uh, but he's also kind of references different uh, eras in, in, in uh, uh, European and U.S. history of, of these uh, times when, you know, we've had conflicts, especially, you know, through war, because obviously this is the reference, to, this is the scope that he's kind of looking in, where in these war times, You'd figure people would be absolutely falling apart, but it's actually the, the, the opposite. People actually come together even better than where they were when they were in wartime. And it's kind of paradoxical in thinking, but the reason behind it in, in his theories and, and supports it very well is that we're naturally tribal beings. And I think this is something that we both agree on. And we've you know, heard Rob Wolf and all these, every, you know, it, it's ad nauseum at this point that we're, you know, kind of, we're, in bands of, of, of uh, tribes, about 50 people deep, we had intricate relationships with all those people in the tribes. And the further and further we get away from that, the more and more likely we are to be dissatisfied with our lives, to be disconnected, to have uh, worse health, both physically and mentally. And that, uh, you know, when we go back to these tribal ways, we in turn improve our physical and mental health. So I, I would definitely, A, suggest the read to anybody because he, he, it's fantastic writing. Um, one of the examples that he has is how uh, during the, uh, you know, d- during the industrialization of North America, how the Europeans come in, there were never, I mean, there were tons of times where European settlers would run off with the quote unquote savages and assimilate toward uh, American Indian culture. They would, they would love it. They were like, oh my God, they either get captured or they would desert their, their towns, but they would go into these tribes and they would finally be free. You know, it was egalitarian where, you know, you, you pull your weight, your, that's your worth. There's nothing given to anybody. It's all earned. Women have a much more uh, influential uh, aspect in the hierarchy and the social structure. Whereas, you know, the European way was, you know, you have these laws and orders and you follow them and this is the way it is. Um, You know, uh, laws were put in place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there was never incidences of the Indians, American Indians going and staying with the settlers and being happy. Every time it was the American, you know, the, the, the Europeans going and living as in tribes. So, again, it goes back to what we're saying. Now, fast forward you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, as I'm walking into my gym today, I recognize that this is a tribe and how mm-hmm. influential it could be on people's lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is one of the things that has been the hallmark of kind of the, started with the CrossFit movement, but, you know, any sort of group shared struggle, even if contrived, it still brings out um, you know, a, a certainly a tribal, um, tribal feeling. I suppose that's probably what the draw of all, any one of thousands and thousands of niche interests, whether they're sport and physical based, like me and my little community of, you know, flatland BMX bikers that are, mm-hmm. have their own unique thing, or whether it's, you know, somebody that does, plays a certain musical instrument or, you know, goes down the line, right? And, yep. That, that's probably uh, one of the things that drives it maybe more than the actual activity itself is the tribal feeling that you can get from it. Yep. 
Yep. And and specifically, what is great about uh, you know fitness culture is a communal struggle for something. And I think that's the biggest part is because you know there's one thing that is uh, you know let's say it's a knitting group. You know the level of struggle and the uh, amount of some of that primal uh, instinct to help and provide for others is embedded into us. So, you know, we look at today's culture and we see a lot of me first mentality. Uh, There's a lot of greed. There's a lot of uh, underhandedness. There's a lot of stealing. And a lot of this is created with the myth that, if I take care of myself, I will be more happy. If I get all these things that give me security, that will bring me happiness. But uh, again, we see over and over again that they really don't do that statistically and, and through doing, uh, doing the research and, and seeing that, you know, after about an income of like $85,000 or something like that, your happiness doesn't increase anymore. Uh, but the fact that when you are giving to a group bigger than yourself, that is what starts to bring happiness. So we have uh, the ability to be in a group that, 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 uh, that you can serve Uh, you, that you're doing a vocation that gives you worth. Those are the things that start to influence our ability to, to have happiness and to have fulfillment. Yes. Makes perfect sense. And yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, you look at, you know, anecdotally about some of the things that I've done in my past and the worst experiences I had with jobs are the ones that, A, I really wasn't appreciated for what I was doing, and B, I didn't see a bigger picture of just outside of myself. It's like, oh, great, you did this X, Y, and Z, you get paid for it, but I'm like, yeah, but you know what, like, that really doesn't bring value into my life, whereas, like, I would get paid less for certain things, but because I was doing it for the group, I got much more fulfillment in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, all really good stuff. Yeah, I'll have to put that on the uh, on the yeah, read list. I, I have heard of it. And, Sebastian yeah. Younger. I, I, man, I listen to the audio book. I've been listening to so many podcasts recently. I'm, I'm, I've always had an embarrassment of saying that I, I want to start you know, doing more audio books. But you know what? If I'm not going to pick up the actual book, I might as well just start listening. Yeah, that definitely can be handy. I, I – um, Myself, I prefer reading. That's why I read the transcript of the the oral biome. Yep. And I think either I get through it faster or I'm just more wired that way. But Yeah. I'm an audiovisual person. Uh, I, I'll also do reading along with the listening. So maybe I'll actually mm. have to reread it with the audio as well because it was only about a three-hour po- like, uh, audio book. So I'm like, wow, all right, I'm flying through this thing. I think I about, got about – 40 minutes left or something like that. So it's not that bad. And again, it would take me a month to read this thing if I had just kind of sat down and uh, yeah. piece by piece. So mm-hmm. um, some, of, some of the things, if I'm in a pleasure, you know, doing it for pleasure, I'll sit down and read. But I think when it comes to trying to get the information, I think maybe an audiobook for me might be a little bit better. Yeah. Yep. You know what I mean? Totally see that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's probably a good spot to stop with today. You got anything else there, Scotty? Oh, uh, no. Uh Getting, uh, oh, I guess we'll, I'll be here next Friday, and then I will be uh, in California in the following week. So oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be in the warm. Well, I guess we'll both be in the warm spot then, maybe. <laughs> yeah, man. Maybe, I'll, maybe we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have to do a, a remote podcast for you, Scotty, if possible. Yeah, no, it should be good to go. I don't have anything really fun to plan that day. The main event stuff happens on the weekend, so. Sweet, dude. Sounds good. All right, well, All right. I'm on. LaFlock, you can get me at Sean across at DollarBeach.com. I am Scott. You can get me at Scott at CrossFitPortland.com. I what is that know. shirt, Scott? Do you remember this? Can you see? That is a black sheep yes. with a C on it for those listening. What was that? And three white sheep. It is a Catalyst Athletics black sheep shirt. Oh, man. That's another throwback from Scotty. <laughs> Total throwback. It's almost brand new because it was like really pretty small. I got it right about the time I was starting to bulk up. And so I uh-huh. never could really wear it because I it was just you know, really too small. But now that I'm really light again, um, it fits me. So it's like a new shirt, even though it's old. Oh, man, you're lucky. <laughs>
All right, Scotty. Well, we'll talk to you next time, brother. All right. Take care, Sean. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs>